Okay, so here is the bell work that goes along with 4.2a, which is the lesson we are doing today. Again, this is in your packet, and if you do not have the packet, then you can get one from the substitute. I have left extras. So you are supposed to use the figure to identify the following. I want you to find all pairs of alternate interior angles. You can use your notes from 4.1 if you need to, and also find all pairs of corresponding angles. So pause the video, do that now, and then you can check with me in a second. So first let's start with the pairs of alternate interior angles. Alternate interior angles are inside two lines that are cut by a transversal and they're on alternate sides of the transversal. So again, the transversal is the single line that cuts through the others. So the alternate interior angles would be angle three and angle six, that's one pair, and then angle four and angle five are the other pair. Then we can do corresponding angles. Corresponding angles are in the same position on two separate intersections. So I could say angle three and angle seven. I could also do angle one and angle five, angle two and angle six, and angle four and angle eight. So again, we have to get more comfortable with these angle relationships because we are going to be seeing them the rest of this unit. So we are doing 4.2, which is called Parallel Lines and Transversals Theorems. And the objective is I can identify angle relationships in parallel lines cut by a transversal. So we are going to start with this little exploration, and this is similar to what we were doing in 4.1. It says, in the figure to the right, which angles do we know are congruent to one another? So we need to think about some background knowledge on what types of angles are congruent in general. And there is one type of angles called vertical angles that we have studied before that are always congruent to each other. So anytime you have two angles that are vertical, they're on the opposite side of the same intersection, and they're composed of the same lines, they are going to be congruent to one another. So as I look at this diagram, I notice that angle 1 and 3 are congruent because they're vertical angles. So I can write that out. By that same logic, angle 2 and angle 4 would be congruent. So we can say angle 2 is congruent to angle 4. Okay, so we can do the same thing even on that other intersection, angle 5 is congruent to angle 7. And then lastly, angle 6 is congruent to angle 8. Now, as we look at this, there is one additional question. It says, which other angle could be congruent based on the picture? Okay, so as we're looking, here's what I'm noticing. I have an acute angle and an acute angle, one and three. But on the other intersection, I also have an acute angle at five and an acute angle at seven. And so of these eight angles, if I knew that four of them were congruent, I would have to assume that it would be angle one and angle three and angle five and angle seven, they could be congruent because they're all acute versus all of our obtuse angles. So angle four and angle two and angle six and angle eight. Again, if there were more congruent angles, those would be the ones that would have to be congruent, and we can just do that off of them being acute or obtuse. But what's cool about today is that's what we're going to be talking about. When you have two lines that are parallel, which may not have been super apparent in this example, although with those two triangles we have parallel lines, but when I have parallel lines cut by a transversal, which is what this third line is, we actually do end up with a lot of different congruent angles, okay? And so that's what we're going to be talking about today as we define some of these really important properties um, in this unit. We're talking about if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, 
what happens. And so we've seen these angle relationships before, corresponding angles, alternate interior angles, alternate exterior angles, and consecutive interior angles. But if you have those angles on parallel lines cut by a transversal, then what happens? And so that's what we're talking about today with our uh, all of these theorems. So again, this situation is going to apply to every single theorem, and you'll notice these theorems are in that if-then format. So we were talking about logic notation last unit. If something happens, then something happens. So that's how we're formatting these theorems. Again, just like that logic stuff we did, they're all conditional statements. And we can go through and we can kind of identify some of these really important theorems for this unit. So first off, we have the corresponding angles theorem. Okay, that's our first theorem that we're going to see, the corresponding angles theorem, which says, again, start with the highlighted section, if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the pairs of corresponding angles are congruent. So this is our first kind of universal truth we have when parallel lines are cut by a transversal. So again, let's go to our picture down here. I have two parallel lines, and I know that because they have those little triangles on them. And so we are told, now that we know I have parallel lines cut by this transversal, all corresponding angles are congruent. So some examples of that would be like 2 and 6. Since we have parallel lines cut by a transversal, that means that those corresponding angles are congruent to each other. Okay, another example on this specific picture would be angle one being congruent to angle five. So anytime we have that situation, parallel lines cut by a transversal, corresponding angles are gonna match up and be congruent to each other. Now we can do the same thing with alternate interior angles theorem. So again, we start with the highlighted section. If two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the pairs of alternate interior angles are congruent. So when you have parallel lines, they're cut by a transversal. If you go to the inside of the parallel lines on alternate sides of the transversal, those angles are congruent. So in this picture, that would be angle three being congruent to angle six. And then the other example would be angle four being congruent to angle five. And I'm not gonna draw all of them in just cause it'll get a little hectic. But again, when we can identify alternate interior angles on parallel lines that are cut by a transversal, lots of, lots of words for that situation, but they are congruent to each other. Now, I have seen this before, and this might help you, so I guess I will include it. Some people call these Z angles, and it's because when you trace the angles, they kind of make a Z shape. So if you're having a hard time remembering how to identify alternate interior angles, then you can use that idea that they look like Z angles, and that might help you. Okay, next we're going to talk about alternate exterior angles. So alternate exterior angles theorem says if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the pairs of alternate exterior angles are congruent. Are you noticing a theme here? We got a lot of congruent things. So if I'm on the exterior of the parallel lines, alternate sides of the transversal, those angles are congruent, so that would be angle 2 being congruent to angle 7. Alternately, angle 1 is congruent to angle 8, because they're alternate exterior, so they're congruent in that situation. And then lastly, the consecutive interior angles theorem. So consecutive interior angles, this is the one that's just a little bit different. Consecutive interior angles are both inside the parallel lines, but they're next to each other. And so if I look, an example would be angle four and angle six, they're not congruent to each other. One of them's acute, one of them's obtuse, so that would not be possible, but they are supplementary. And so that's that last kind of random 
situation that comes up, our fourth angle relationship is those consecutive interior angles, and they're actually not congruent like you would expect with all the other ones, but they are supplementary. So for example, uh, angle four plus angle six is 180 degrees, but also angle three and angle five are 180 degrees. Okay, and so anytime you have two angles that are basically touching each other, right, or not, they're next to each other, I mean they're consecutive, they're right by each other, um, they're going to be supplementary instead of congruent to one another. So again, super important theorems that are going to come back a lot this unit, <clears throat> but the theorem goes with the type of angles. So the theorem that goes with the corresponding angles is the corresponding angles theorem. The theorem that goes with alternate interior angles is the alternate interior angles theorem. So uh, we will be using those theorems to justify some proofs and things that we are doing later this unit and later today, I believe. All right, so first example based off this content, it says one angle measure is given in the diagram below. Find all of the other angle measures and state the theorem or definition you used to find that measure. So we still can use vertical angles and linear pairs to help us out, and that's where I'm going to start on this one. I'm going to say, okay, I have one angle that's 120 degrees, okay? Well, right off the bat, I also know that angle 4 is 120 degrees, and I know that because it's a vertical angle with the 120 degree angle. So again, we still can use the fact that vertical angles are congruent to each other. Since that angle is vertical with the 120 degree angle, then it would also be 120 degrees. Okay, beyond that, I can look at angle three and I can say, hey, that has to be, and let me write these in, let's see, 120 degrees here. Hey, angle three has to be 60 degrees. And you're like, well, how do you know that? Well, it has to be a linear pair with the original angle of 120 degrees or with angle four as well. So angle three is 60 degrees. How did I know that? Well, it's a linear pair with angle four, or again, you could use that 120 degree angle. And then following that, angle two is also 60 degrees because it's vertical angles with angle three. So as we go through and we're kind of labeling all these angles, they're building on each other, okay? You're gonna find an angle which will lead to another angle, which will lead to another angle. Now we can also start leading on our new theorems. So angle two, if I'm looking at angle two, that is alternate interior with angle seven. So angle seven also has to be 60 degrees. And again, I can say that that was the alternate interior angles theorem. Because I have two parallel lines. I know that because the little triangles, they're cut by a transversal. So all those angle relationships would be present. So angle two and angle seven are alternate interior they have to be congruent to each other. Well, that's pretty cool because angle six is vertical. Sorry, let me go back to the pen. Angle six is vertical with angle seven. So angle six is also 60 degrees, and I can say that's vertical angles with angle seven. Or that also is alternate exterior angles with angle three, so that's kind of interesting. Angle eight, just to use some of our new theorems, angle eight is corresponding with angle four. So I can say angle eight is 120 degrees. And let's use that new theorem, corresponding angles theorem. And then through any of those different theorems, I could say that angle five is also 120 degrees. Um, and let me do its alternate interior with 
angles. Um, and again, it was alternate interior angles with angle four. Right, so we have some different angles going on. We also mentioned the theorems. You could also go through if you didn't want to do the theorem and say what the alternate interior angle was. So like angle five goes with angle four, and that's maybe what I should have done on this. Um, but also using those theorems is really good. There we go. All right, so again, we're really just exploring those angle relationships. How are things related? Stuff like that. All right, this is similar to what you're going to see on your homework. So it says, using properties of parallel lines, solve the following, find the value of x. Okay, so first off, we are going to find two different things in this situation. Okay, first off, I want to find x, but I can't do that yet. Okay, and the reason why is I don't have enough information. So what this kind of problem did also was it gave me what I'm going to call a helper angle. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to find the red angle first, then we're going to use that to find x. Okay, so here's where I'm going to start. I'm going to say I want to find the measure of angle 4. What do I know about angle 4? Well, if you look at it, it looks like angle 4 is vertical with a 115 degree angle. So that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say measure of angle 4 equals 115 degrees. Okay, that has to be true. But I'm also going to justify it because that's what we're practicing. So it's vertical angles with 115 degrees. Okay, again, vertical angles we know from before are congruent with one another. So this is a 115 degree angle. Now, how does that angle relate to x? How does that angle relate to x? Well, it looks to me like angle 4 and the angle x plus 5, you know, degrees are consecutive interior angles. And based on the consecutive interior angles theorem, that means they have to be supplementary. That's what that theorem tells us. So I would be totally justified if I said, okay, well then 115 plus x plus 5 has to be 180 degrees because those two angles have to add up to 180 degrees because they're supplementary. That's what the theorem tells me. And so then, and this little degree sign doesn't need to be here, but then we can go through and we're just solving an equation like normal. So kind of all year we've been setting up an equation that has to be true and then solving that. That's what's going on here as well. So I have like terms, 115 and 5. So that would be x plus 120 equals 180 degrees. And then I can subtract 120 from both sides to get the value of x x equals 60 degrees, or just 60 because it's an x value. And again, I always put degrees on there accidentally like a goof, but that would be that x value. All right, so same idea on this one. We're given kind of that red colored angle to help us out. We got to find that one. Then we can go from there. So I'm going to look at that and I'm going to say, okay, well, how can I find the measure of angle one? First things first, I notice, what am I noticing? Well, the measure of angle one, I, I'm not sure what it is right now, but angle one and 136 degree angle are a linear pair. That's what I notice. They're a linear pair. And a linear pair is supplementary. Okay, so we're bringing that, that's previous knowledge that we've seen before. So I can do 180 minus 136 to get the measure of angle one. So if I did that, I would get a 44 degree angle for the measure of angle one. Okay, so we can write that down. Again, that is previous knowledge we've seen before, but that is going to help us with our additional angle. Then I want to think, what is my relationship between angle one and 7x plus 9? Okay, and we're going to define that. So angle one and that angle 7x plus 9 degrees, whatever, are alternate exterior angles. They're both outside parallel lines on opposite sides of the transversal. So that means, based off the alternate exterior angles theorem, that they would have to be congruent to each other. 
So again, we're saying, well, what is the relationship between all these angles? How can we turn that into an equation that we can solve? So as I look at this, since angle one, which is a 44 degree angle, is alternate exterior with that 7x plus 9 angle, we can set them equal to each other. 7x plus 9 has to equal 44. Why? Because the theorem tells me that those angles are congruent. And then we can use that information to solve 4x. So I can subtract 9 from both sides. I get that 7x equals 35. And I can divide both sides by 7 to get that x equals 5. So again, anytime we're setting up um, an equation and solving for x, our goal is to find something that has to be true, turn that information into equation, and then solve. So again, on both of these, we were just solving for x, but it takes a second, right? We're using those angle relationships. And here's the other thing, okay? If you are like, where are these angle relationships coming from? Your alternate kind of more elementary basic approach, I would just go through and I'd label every single angle, okay? So that'd be your other option. You could say, I know this is 115, so this has to be 65. 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 That'd be your other way of doing it, you know, and go through, just label every single angle, and then you could use that to find X as well. But the whole point of this lesson is to practice those theorems. So again, that's kind of worst case scenario. I have no idea what these theorems are doing, but you can find all the angles, and then you could use that to find your X value as well. Okay, so again, that would be like not what you want, <laughs> but um, if that's going to get you to the answer, then that might be a good way to check or might be kind of a good backup plan. All right, one more page. So it says, given the measure of angle one equaling 105 degrees, find all the angle measures. So actually, this is a good example, kind of what I was talking about. Um, if you are not feeling confident with your angle relationships, that doesn't mean you can't label the picture. So as I go through, I know because it's given that the measure of angle one is 105 degrees. Okay, well, that's going to lead to every other angle in this picture. So angle four is also 105 degrees because it's vertical angles with angle one. Sorry, and I wrote angle five. Whoops. There we go. Well, I also know that angle five is going to be 105 degrees because it's alternate interior with angle four. And angle 8 is 105 degrees because it is vertical with angle 5. And I keep saying angle 5 and writing angle 5. No. Here we go. Angle 8. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. You can go through and you can end up kind of labeling every angle. Now I could do that with the other one. So angle 3, measure of angle 3. Well, how is that related to angle one? It's not going to be 105 degrees, or we are going to have way more than 360 degrees around this intersection, but it is supplementary. It's a linear pair with angle one. So I can say, okay, well, that means that has to be 75. Well, what else has to be 75? Literally every other angle that I haven't labeled yet. So measure of angle three would be 75 degrees. Measure of angle two would be 75 degrees. Measure of angle six would be 75 degrees, and measure of angle seven would be 75 degrees. Okay, so you'll see as we go through, we can kind of label a lot of these angles. Once you find one, a lot of the other ones kind of follow along with that. And then number six, that's what we're going to do before we do that last uh, proof. So it says, use the figure to find the measure of angle one, the measure of angle two, and the measure of angle three, justifying each measure. Okay, so there's a couple things we can do here. Um, I'm actually going to start going backwards because I think it's easier on this example. So I'll write all these in, measure of angle one, measure of angle two, measure of angle three. We're also going to practice justifying, but I'm going to start with angle three, and here's why. Okay. As I look, I actually have three parallel lines. What the heck? There's a bunch. But if you have a third parallel line, you still are going to have all those angle relationships. You're just going to have third intersection, so even more things we know. But I can look at angle three and I can say, okay, well, that is consecutive interior with the 133-degree angle. 
So the measure of angle three has to be 47 degrees because of that relationship. It's consecutive interior with 133 degree angle. Now, if I know that that angle is 47 degrees, that is a linear pair with angle two. Okay, that's also alternate interior with that 133 degree angle. So we can uh, conclude that that other angle, measure of angle two is 133 degrees. And again, I actually know that two ways. It's a linear pair with angle three or it's alternate interior with the 133 degree angle. Then lastly, I can find the measure of angle one, and this is actually kind of the hardest one, but I have two parallel lines cut by a transversal. So actually angle one and angle three are alternate interior angles, so they would have the same measurement as well. So angle one's also gonna be 47 degrees, because it's alternate interior with angle three. So they would have to be congruent also. Now, last but not least, we are going to be practicing a proof. And I like this note packet a lot, but there is actually one typo on this page. So for example seven, we're trying to prove that if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the pairs of, and let's do corresponding angles are congruent. Okay, so again, cross out alternate interior angles. That's actually not what we're going to be proving. We are going to be proving that corresponding angles are congruent. Okay, so here's what we're given. Again, just like we did with algebraic proofs, you're given something, that's where you start. So we're given that we have two parallel lines. P is parallel to Q. And just like we did before, that is where we start. So on my uh, little two column proof, we can say that P is parallel to Q. And that's given. Okay. Now what we're trying to prove is that corresponding angles are congruent. So angle one and angle three are the corresponding angles that I have, and we're going to be proving that um, through this proof process, okay? So we're trying to prove that one and three are congruent. Right now, all we know is that we have parallel lines. Well, here's the first thing that I'm going to mention, okay? I have a couple different angle relationships going on, and, I, and I'm just gonna kind of write them down. So I see that the measure of angle two has to be congruent to the measure of angle three. I just noticed that when I look at this picture. And the reason why is because the definition of vertical angles And this is one of those, sometimes proofs you can do in a couple orders. So you'll see the answer key actually has these middle two steps flipped, but it can go either way. So I know that angle two and angle three have to be congruent because they're vertical angles, and I'm bringing that into this problem, right? So I knew that before. But then there's something new we know from today that angle one has to be congruent to the measure of angle two. And the reason I know that is the alternate interior angles theorem. So anytime you have parallel lines cut by a transversal, those alternate interior angles have to be congruent because the theorem tells me so. And then what's cool now is we can look at this and say, okay, wait a sec, do you see how I have two different things that have to be congruent to the measure of angle two? Do you see that? I have two different things that have to be congruent to the measure of angle two. So what that tells me is that by the transitive property, the measure of angle one can be congruent to the measure of angle three. Okay, because both of those angles are congruent to angle two, that means they would be congruent to each other. And so that's how a proof works. If you're given something and you're using the theorems and the definitions and the properties that we've seen before, can we get to what we're trying to prove, which is that angle one was congruent to angle three, which is what we were able to get to. Okay, so that is an example of a geometric proof. Again, Geometric proofs tend to be a little bit more challenging than algebraic proofs, but it's the same idea 
and we're going to continue practicing those over the next couple lessons. All right, guys, thank you. Please be good for this hub, and I will see you next time.